We praise you and bless and worship your holy name, Lord. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your love. We thank you for sending Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son, into the world to die on the cross. We thank you that he took our sins, our sicknesses, our pains. He bore our condemnation. He shed his blood to redeem our soul. The third day he rose victorious from the grave. We thank you that Jesus is ascended. He's glorified at the right hand of the Father. That all power in heaven and in earth is given unto him. And that in his name we have authority over all the forces of evil. We praise thee and thank thee, Lord, for this. Now we commit this meeting into thy hand. We bind every evil influence that would in any way hinder or oppose. We claim the protection of the shed blood of Jesus over every person here. We pray that everyone shall be open to the truth and kept from error and deception, that thy word will have free course and not return to thee void, but accomplish thy pleasure, prosper in the thing whereto thou hast sent it. And we will be careful, Lord, in everything to ascribe to thee and to thee alone all the praise Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I would like every person to follow me in saying that three times. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We praise various areas within a person where Satan may make his presence felt, the various means by which he may torment, defile, enslave, harass, compel, and deceive and entice. But I left out the whole area of religion because this is so important that I wanted to deal with it in one separate period. Now I've got three particular things I'm going to deal with in succession. The second and the third concern religion, but the first, which I'm just going to do very briefly, is another source of problem which is very, very common, and few people realize how common it is, and many people are ensnared by it without knowing it. So I'm going to deal with these three successive things. The domination of one person by another. Secondly, heresies, departures from the Christian faith. And thirdly, false religion. Let me begin briefly by speaking about a situation in which one person is dominated by another. It is never the will of God for any human soul to be dominated by any other human soul. It is never the will of God for parents to dominate their children, for a husband to dominate his wife, for a wife to dominate her husband, for a pastor to dominate his congregation, or for any other person in any situation to dominate another person. And yet many people have grown up in life either dominating or being dominated by. I have discovered recently that one of the greatest single hindrances to people receiving complete deliverance is the fact that they have been dominated by their mother. Many mothers seek to control their children's lives, to plan their destiny, to arrange the vocation that they will follow, and to keep them under their control. This is extraordinary how far-reaching it is. An Assembly of God evangelist, I didn't mean to say that, but anyhow, that's what he was, came to me about four years ago, and he asked to counsel with me, and I spent some hours eating a meal with him and talking with him. At the end, we went back to his hotel room, and he asked me to pray for his deliverance. Before we prayed, I said this, I only have one source of information about yourself and your family, and that is from what you have told me personally. But I said, on the basis of what you have told me, I have to tell you one thing. In my opinion, your mother is a witch. And he said, that's what my wife said. <laughs> and I said, I agree with your wife. Now, his mother was a good Pentecostal lady sitting up in the front rows of the Pentecostal church every Sunday, and so on and so forth. Well, I prayed for that man, and I got my hand on his shoulder, and I just had to run for the waste paper basket. I got there just in time, and he spent the next 20 minutes bringing up great strings of slimy fluid, sub slimy fluid substance. I prayed with him for maybe half an hour, 40 minutes, left him, phoned him next day to find out how he was doing. He said, I feel wonderful. 
But he said, I feel as if I've just been through a 12-mile race. Every bone in my body is aching. Well, I said, that's the result of deliberate. And then he said to me something which impressed me. He said, you know, isn't it remarkable? Yesterday, you and I had lunch together, and I ate fried chicken. But he said, whatever I brought up, there was no vestige of chicken or anything else that I'd eaten in it. He said, wherever it came from, it didn't come from my stomach. And that really made me think. Well, I've seen, I wouldn't like to count the buckets of fluid that I've seen people bring up in deliverance. And I've realized, let me say this, that as I understand it, this is not the demon, but it's the nest that the demon has made in your body. And when the demon goes, its nest better go with it. Sometimes people go on with this process of physical cleansing for three or four days or even a week. They'll go on bringing up and bringing up. I say, don't turn it off. Go through with it. Get your body cleansed. That's not the demon. You don't see the demon. But it's his particular little nest that he's built up in your body to inhabit. You see, the Bible says, He that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. This is a definite statement of Scripture. And I believe personally that everybody that practices fornication invites a demon which builds its own unclean area of inhabitation inside that body. As a matter of fact, in many cases, I can tell people what they are being delivered from by seeing the form that their deliverance takes. Almost each type of evil spirit is characteristic in what it tends to produce. To go back to this evangelist, I didn't... Then he said to me, this is part of the story, he said, we have a daughter who has tremendous problems. She's 13 years old, goes out all night with men, is on drugs, is attending a well-known full gospel high school or college, and we can do nothing with her. Do you advise anything? Well, I said, first of all, go home, talk with your wife, tell her what's happened to you, get together in prayer, get to the point where you really agree in the Spirit, and then take some item of clothing that your daughter wears, lay hands on it, and curse the demons. So that was what I told him. A year later, he was back in the area, he phoned me, and he said, uh, he wanted to tell me how he was getting on, he said, how are you doing? He said, fine, things are changing. He said, I'm not without struggles, but my ministry is quite different from what it was before. He said, what about your daughter? He said, she's enrolled in an Episcopal girls' school, has a scholarship, and is doing wonderful. Straight A's all the way through, she's straightened out and become a sensible girl. And I said, what about it? How did you operate? Well, he said, we did what you said. We got a blue T-shirt that she likes very much. And without telling her, we prayed over it and then just watched her wear it. <laughs> but he said, there's something more than that. One day, the girl's grandmother, my mother, came to the house and did something she wouldn't normally do, offered to do some washing for my wife. And in the items that she washed was the blue T-shirt. And ever since my mother washed that T-shirt, she's been a different woman. <laughs> now, the point about this mother was that with all the best intentions in the world, she was dominating her son, her son's wife, and her son's children. And she was using spiritual power to control an entire family. Now listen, witchcraft, and I've got it up on the board, is the attempt to control people and make them do what you want by a power other than the Holy Spirit. And if you have a power in your life that you can use, it isn't the Holy Spirit, because no one uses the Holy Spirit. He's God. Now, this is tremendously common. Many, many people are still tied by a spiritual umbilical cord to their mother. In many cases, total deliverance does not come until that umbilical cord in the spiritual realm is cut. Now, I'm not teaching disobedience. I believe the Bible teaches, Honor thy father and thy mother, that it may be well with thee. But nevertheless, it is not the will of God for any one person to dominate any other person, to control them. It's remarkable that you find many times that a mother will know when her daughter is seeking the Lord and will start phoning and bringing pressure upon her. She may be eaten up with self-pity and every time that family is going to move out and go the mother will phone, come and help me, come and hold my hand, come and stand by me. Now I want to warn you, don't let 
anybody dominate your life. And if you've been in that situation where you've been dominated by a father or a mother, this afternoon before this meeting closes, exercise the authority given to you in the name of Jesus and loose yourself from that dominion. And if you have hatred or unforgiveness in your heart as a result of that attempted domination, forgive the father or the mother or the person, whoever it may be, because you cannot loose yourself from someone if you resent them or hate them hate them. The very resentment and hatred itself constitutes a bond which ties you to them. Now it is not always apparent, it may be other cases. Many, many cases some of you have been influenced by spiritual, quote, persons who've tried to take you over. This happens very often with prayer groups. Some dominating strong spiritual lady will move in and just begin to exercise control over that prayer group. Now listen, the Holy Spirit never causes a minister of the gospel to dominate others. If you come to the place where you're more tied to that woman than you are to the Lord, where you hardly dare to take a decision without consulting the Lord, you are bound, and not in a good way, and not by the Spirit of the Lord. There is a church, and it's not so very far from here, where the biggest item in the expense is the long-distance phone bill. Because every time the pastor wants to make a decision, he phones a certain lady in another state and gets her to give him the mind of the Lord. And she flips the pages of the Bible, uses the name of Jesus, and comes out with a pronouncement which is what runs that entire church. I could tell you some extraordinary and even ridiculous examples of this, but I'm not going to do it. That church and its minister are bound And the people that attend that church come under that bondage. And the woman behind it, in plain, simple language, is a witch. A religious witch, a full gospel witch, a charismatic witch, and all the more dangerous for that. All right, now let's go on to the second phase of our teaching, heresies. These are departures from the Christian faith. There's nothing on the board about them yet. We're coming a little later. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. And 2. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, that's with the times in which we are living, some shall depart from the faith. The faith is Christianity. So here are people who have been in the Christian faith and turn away from it. We are not dealing with unbelievers or people who've never made a profession of faith in Christ, we're dealing specifically with those who have professed faith in Christ. It says, Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. And then it's the demons, not the people, who speak lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And it gives examples of two doctrines. One is food fads, commanding people not to eat certain kinds of meat, and it doesn't mean meat in the sense of flesh, but it means food. That's old English. Never let anybody start dictating to you about the kind of food that you're to eat. No pork, no bacon, and all this business. It is not scriptural. Every creature of God is good, and to be received, for it is sanctified with the word of God and prayer. Now, the Jews under the law of Moses were forbidden to eat a whole lot of things, but we are not under the law of Moses. There are only four things required of Gentiles who come into the Christian faith. First of all, that we abstain from fornication, secondly, from idolatry, thirdly, from things strangled, and fourthly, from eating blood. We are not permitted to eat blood with flesh. That is still out just as much as fornication or idolatry. It's in the same category. This you'll find in the 15th chapter of the book of Acts. But we are not commanded to observe any other of the food rules that were imposed upon Israel under the law of Moses. And any attempt to force you under these food and dietary rules in the name of making you more spiritual is demonic. Now, if you don't like bacon, you don't have to eat it. But don't make a religion out of it. That's all. I delivered... By the grace of God, a woman from demons. She's a woman whom I know well today, a friend of ours. Uh, There came out of her 
altogether by the account of somebody who was present, 72 different spirits that named themselves. The first one was sorcery, the second one was witchcraft. We'll come to them in a moment. A little way down the line, after about a couple of hours, there was one that said, I'm a seducing spirit. I said, well, come out in the name of Jesus. He said, I'm the seducer of the faith. Well, I said, still come out in the name of Jesus. It said, I have many roots. Well, I said, come out with all your roots in the name of Jesus. And then the roots began coming out. And after three or four had come out, I suddenly realized that these were the roots. And I grabbed a pad. It was in the Conrad Hilton Hotel in Chicago. I still have the pad. And I wrote down each root as it came out. And I got 37 different spirits of error. The fourth one said, no pork, no bacon, no pork, no bacon, no pork, no bacon. If I told you some of the others, you'd fall off the chair. But I'm not going to. But I just want to point out, have you noticed about health food stores that the unhealthiest people are always there? Did you never notice that? <laughs> Brother, if their gospel worked, they'd look different. <laughs> now, please don't misunderstand me. If you don't like or don't wish to eat certain kinds of food, you are at complete liberty. But don't let it become a spiritual law, because that's a deception. Now, I was on the verge of this, and God yanked me back. I was drinking so much carrot juice, I was turning yellow. <laughs> uh, literally, I mean literally yellow. And I was talking to a, spirit, a preacher. I didn't regard him as very spiritual. For one thing, he was rather fat, and I have a sort of thing about fat preachers. But <laughs> and I was telling him how careful I was about what I ate. And he quoted to me, every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. And oh, how I praise God for that man. He got me out from the very verge of the ditch. And I had enough humility to listen to him. Say, he's right, I'm wrong. Another form of satanic deception mentioned here is the turning away from the normal marriage sex relationship. Do not let anybody fool you into being super spiritual by living an unnatural sex life because it just isn't right. If you're married, you're married. Totally. Now, I say this because, again, I've seen cases where there was a certain man on the West Coast some years back, a Presbyterian, baptized in the Holy Spirit. He said, now, come on, these Pentecostals, they're not with it. They don't tell you half the truth. I'll tell you how to be a real overcomer. Step number one, you come out and listen to me. Uh, that's always step number one. Step number two, you uh, sell what you have. Step number three, you stop living with your wife. And brother, those people ended up one after another in a mental breakdown. So be on your guard. The, the gospel rightly proclaimed is the most normal, healthy, sane thing in the world. Never go off on a tangent in order to be spiritual because you may be spiritual, but it's the wrong spirit. All right, now let's look in Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1. I want to go on on the theme of heresies. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, that's Israel, even as there shall be false teachers among you, the church, who privily, in a sneaky, underhand way, shall bring in damnable heresies, heresies that bring damnation even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. We are specifically warned that in the church there will be false teachers who in a sneaky, underhand way will introduce heresies that bring damnation to those who teach them and those who believe them. And this has happened and is happening. Now a heresy means literally choosing. And heresy is, in essence, choosing how much of the Bible you will believe. Every heresy accepts part of the Bible. All heresies claim to start from the Bible. All heresies quote Jesus Christ. But the essence of a heresy is you decide how much you will believe. God didn't ask you to make that decision, and it doesn't rest with you. God says this is his word, and you better believe it all. Now, the essence of a damnable heresy... It's summed up in that phrase, even denying the Lord that bought them. It's a denial of the Lord Jesus Christ and his redemptive work on the cross. And any heresy, any teaching under the guise of Christianity 
that touches the person, the nature, and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ is a damnable heresy. And you better believe that churches which might be called Methodist, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, or any other such thing are literally filled with damnable heresies. And in many cases, it's the ministers who are preaching these damnable heresies. Let me give you an example. Let me tell you what I believe about Jesus. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he's divine eternally. I believe that he was born of a virgin, that he led a sinless life, that he died an atoning death, that he rose the third day physically from the dead, that he's ascended into heaven, and that one day he's coming again in person just as he was seen to go. Now, if you have any problem about any of those statements, you better check your spiritual foundation. And any kind of teaching that denies any one of those statements is a damnable heresy. And we have been warned, no matter how respectable it may be, the main source of these damnable heresies is the seminaries. They are the actual fountainhead of these heresies. The fact that a man has been trained in a seminary and has three kinds of degrees after his name should be a warning to you to suspect damnable heresy, not to believe what he says. The, the first epistle of John, chapter 2, verse John, chapter 2, verses 18 through 22. Again, a warning about the last days and deception and error, and a particular spirit of deception, the spirit of anti-Christ. Let me say that anti-Christ means two things. The word anti means, first of all, against, and secondly, in place of. The spirit of anti-Christ has a double work. First of all, it's against Jesus Christ to get him out of the church. Secondly, its design is to replace him by the false Christ. Somebody told me the other day, who's acquainted with the person, that the lady in Washington, who's the subject of a book, and I'm not going to mention her name, <laughs> speaks about the Christ, but you'd better check, because when she speaks about the Christ, she means the false Christ. And this is very prevalent at the moment in most Protestant denominations, the spirit of Antichrist is at work getting Jesus out of the way. I've had friends in Methodist churches, and I'm not attacking Methodists, but they just happen to be Methodists. They tell me in our church, Jesus is a dirty word. You can speak about Socrates, Buddha, Plato, Martin Luther King. It's perfectly all right, but don't talk about Jesus. That is the spirit of Antichrist. It's getting Jesus out of the way. What these people do not realize is that's only the first step. The next step is to put the false Christ in his place. And the scripture indicates that millions and millions of people will shortly be deceived by the spirit of Antichrist. You better be sure you aren't going to be one of them. Now let's read about it. Little children, 1 John 2.18. It is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many antichrists, a mark of the last time, whereby ye know that it is the last time. They went out from us, they started with the Christian church, they all do, they all claim to be Christians, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. This is typical. Every antichrist starts in some way in association with the Christian church, then goes out. And without being in any way controversial or personal, we have had the most remarkable demonstration of this in the person of Bishop Pike, who began in the Christian church a keen preacher of Jesus, was confronted very closely by one of his closest workers and by Dennis Bennett and others with the truth of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, rejected it, turned away from it, and moved into the only other main spiritual field left, the spiritual field of the occult and satanic power, and ended up with a death very similar to that of Judas Iscariot. Remember, the only two persons who are called the son of perdition in Scripture are Judas Iscariot and the Antichrist. And each of them begins in the church. Going on reading. But ye have an unction, verse 20, an anointing from the Holy One, and ye know all things by the anointing. The Spirit of truth in you should tell you what's true and what's false. It should answer to the truth and reject 
false, and you better have that alarm clock inside you really well wound up because you're going to need it. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth. He's not writing to unbelievers, but because ye know it and that no lies of the truth. What's the truth? The word of God. Anything that conflicts with the word of God is a lie. Verse 22, who is a liar? but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Notice, he does not deny God, but he denies the relationship within the Godhead of Father and Son. And basically, he denies that Jesus is the Son of God and has come in the flesh. Turn to 1 John 4. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. A false prophet is a person with a false spirit, see? A no prophet operates in his own spirit. That is not a prophet. A true prophet operates in the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit. A false prophet operates in a false spirit. Therefore, when you meet a prophet, try the spirit. Is it the spirit of God or is it a false spirit? And if it was true then that many false prophets had gone out into the world, it's ten times truer today in modern America. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist whereof ye have heard that it should come. It's very easy. Does the spirit... Does the person confess that Jesus, the Messiah, has come in the flesh? If so, it's of God. But any person that denies that Jesus, the Messiah, has come in the flesh is motivated and controlled by the spirit of Antichrist. Now, if you deny that Jesus was born of a virgin, you deny that he is the Messiah because the Messiah had to be born of a virgin. This is the spirit of Antichrist. Some of you know because you're here that I was invited to preach in quite a well-known Methodist church in the Sunday school and I went there with every intention of being as respectable as I could. I thought, let me not talk about anything controversial like speaking in tongues or anything like that. I'll just give them a simple gospel message. So I did. About six months later I was back in that church or rather in that area, definitely not in that church. And uh, the people that had invited me said, you know, you upset the people in our church. I said, I upset them? How could that be? I thought I was my most respectable and orthodox. Well, this person said, you told them that if Jesus was not born of a virgin, he was a bastard. Well, I said, sure. Isn't that obvious? Who needs to be told that? Well, that's the truth, isn't it? Now, you see, these people that deny the virgin birth do it in the name of intellectual honesty. But they're only halfway honest. They only go half the way. They deny that Jesus is born of a virgin, but they will not go to the logical conclusion saying he was a bastard. Well, that is intellectually dishonest. I believe in intellectual honesty right up to the hill. I believe in tell it the way it is. But this is not honesty. It's deception. Now, these people are most of them not deliberately deceiving. They deceive. Because the Bible says wicked men shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. They deceive because they are deceived. You know, it's an interesting thing. They tell me that the lie detector test will not work on a psychopathic liar. In other words, a liar who's abnormal because that person has no reaction from lying. See? They don't even know they're lying. And that is what happens when a person's mind and personality is taken over by the spirit of deception. They aren't even aware that they are deceiving. It's deceiving and being deceived. All right, that's the spirit of Antichrist, the spirit of heresy and seducing spirit. And they all center around the truth about Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you have come, out, come under the influence of any teaching that in any way touches upon the person the nature or the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, you had better get clear. Loose your spirit and clear your mind from these poisonous lies of the enemy and come back to God in repentance. Bow at the foot of the cross and ask Jesus to take you back. Now we're coming on to the third realm, 
which is false religions, non-Christian religions. And let me lay down certain simple principles. There are two sources of supernatural power. One is God, the other is the devil. And any supernatural power that does not come from God does come from the devil. It's that simple. Now, there is one way and only one way into the realm of God's supernatural power. And that way is Jesus Christ. Let me give you two or three scriptures. John 10, 9, Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. I am the door. By implication, there is no other. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There is no other way to God the Father but by Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And Ephesians 2.18, maybe if you have your Bible you can turn to that because it's rather important to read it. Ephesians 2.18, for through Him, Jesus Christ, we both, Jews and Gentiles, have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Notice, through him, Jesus, and through him alone, by how many spirits? One spirit. There's only one spirit that gives the human access to God the Father. It's the Holy Spirit. And he operates only through the Lord Jesus Christ. If you come by any other door than Jesus, or if you come through any other spirit, no matter what that spirit may profess to be, you do not have access to God. You have access to the realm of Satan. Instead of coming into the realm of light, you come into the realm of dark. But remember that Satan is transformed as an angel of light and his ministers are transformed as ministers of righteousness. And many, many times they'll use beautiful, sweet, loving words and long psychological phrases and even quote scripture to get you into the realm of darkness under the guise of being angels of light. But if you do not come by Jesus Christ, crucified on the cross, and if you do not come by the Holy Spirit of God, you can get into the occult realm. You can get into the supernatural realm. I'm not denying that for a moment because I've been there and I know what it's like. But you get into the wrong realm. Now, I got in by yoga. I was a practicing yogi before I found Jesus. And there was a time when I got out of the natural. But what I got into, even then, it scared me. I didn't like it. I decided once was enough. 